Hey there YouTubers, welcome to Geek Kings. I'm LB, and today I'm going to be starting a new series on the channel called Throwback Thursday, where we'll take a look at the best and worst tech highlights of yesteryear. So to kick off the series, I want to start with, in my opinion, one of the best video game systems of all time, and definitely one of my personal favorites. I spent a lot of quality gaming time with it. It's the Sega Dreamcast. This baby launched in 1999, in fact on September 9th, so 99.99, at 199 was the price point, um, which was a pretty cool marketing uh, idea if you ask me. It got people talking about it. Um, I remember seeing the commercials, it was this cool cyberpunk, you know, it was around the time that The Matrix was out, cyberpunk was really, really popular in the late 90s, and they had this cool, you know, motorcycle in Japan, and it was like this weird... Um, Kind of like secret agent thing and they come into the room and they've got the dreamcast and it's it's thinking so that was cool captured my imagination um this device was very innovative for the time and actually introduced a lot of firsts into the video game world now the story of this console is also very interesting and was basically killed off way before its time i'll get into that a little bit but for those of you who haven't seen a Dreamcast or maybe have just seen it in passing, uh, this is what it looks like. You know, I can give you a short little tour around the device. Uh, on the front, there's four uh, controller ports. This was back when there were wired controllers required in the system. Seems very antiquated these days, but having four ports was very nice since its competitors uh, did not. Uh, the I believe Xbox did. But PS2 only had two, you had to buy a multi-tap, and uh, GameCube, which came out later, had four as well. But this was probably the first console, um, besides the N64, that had four ports. On the front, you've got the logo, the swirl. This was orange in North America, and it was blue in Japan in, uh, Europe. I believe it was also orange in Japan. Orange light down here to show the system was on. The open button, which opened for the disc tray. You put in GD-ROMs, which I'll get to in a bit. Power button. So the left side, the back, you got your power adapter. You've got your serial adapter for certain uh, devices you could plug in. You've got your AV, which used RCA at the time, your vents, and the included 56K modem. This was really, really cool. On the side, you've just got more vents, the bottom, some mounting plates for, I believe this had a um, DVD drive you could add onto this because it couldn't play DVDs. So as I said, I got mine in 1999 after seeing it in a store uh, kiosk running Sonic Adventure and it blew my mind. Just the graphics fidelity and what you could put out on the display were just uh, exponentially better than the previous generation, you know, the PS1, Sega Saturn, N64. Uh, so that really captured my attention. I had a PS1 for a few years, and I've always been a Sega guy. I had a Sega Genesis. That was my first console that I actually owned in my home. Um, and I was always into Sega, so the chance to jump onto the Dreamcast seemed really, really interesting. And the games at launch were amazing. I had one of the best launch lineups of all time, Sonic Adventure. Um, you had NFL 2K. And I'll get into the, my top games later, but it had Power Stone. Um, it had just a really, really great launch lineup. Probably the best, I believe, that we've seen for uh, for a really, really long time. Uh, when this came out, you know, Sega set a new sales record. I think they sold more than 225,000 of these in 24 hours in the U.S. Uh, so at that time, Sega was coming off a big loss from Sega Saturn, uh, kind of that... Uh, generation was a loss for them so this is really their entry back into the game uh, within two weeks they sold about a half a million of these sales were doing really well for a time uh, but they hit a ceiling and the reason they hit a ceiling was for two reasons basically everybody was waiting for the PS2 the PS2 uh, I believe in early 2000 E3 2000 more information came about about, about the PS2 and people were looking to that because PS1 was so great. They were expecting great things from PS2. And that kind of put a cap on the sales of Dreamcast as people were looking ahead to that. The other big one was that EA said that they would not develop games for the system. So you didn't have games like Madden 
or FIFA, NHL hockey, and things like that. So that really um, put a damper on it, uh, as well as at that time, uh, Final Fantasy was really big as an EA game and a few others that the system would just never see. One of the things that also kind of uh, hurt sales of this system, not necessarily of the system, but of games, was that piracy was way too easy. Uh, you could pirate a game simply by uh, downloading a file, an ISO from the internet, burning it onto a CD-ROM, and then it's basically a bootloader. You just pop it in. On the screen, there'd be like a little gold reindeer, and then you would uh, take the pirated disc, so you can either download or buy a pirated disc and pop it in and it would load it. So you didn't have to actually buy the actual disc. So piracy was rampant on this system. And after this debacle with Sega, the other console manufacturers took notice and put a lot more DRM to prevent the rampant piracy. So these all, the PS2 issue, EA and the piracy really conspired to cause the downfall of this. And actually it was discontinued in 2001. So it was only on the market in the US for about uh, two years, a little over two years, which is quite unfortunate because as I said, it's very innovative. Now, what do I mean by that? One of the things I want to point out is this is the first uh, console that had a modem built in. So you could actually play online games out of the box. And this was the first console that I ever played online. Uh, it was a game called Choo Choo Rocket. It was out of Japan. It was kind of like a party puzzle game, but you could play that online. And then later on down the road came Fantasy Star Online, which is one of my favorite games of all time. It's really like what uh, the great-grandfather of games like Destiny um, or even Dragon Ball Xenoverse, things like that, where you've got this online world, you've got your character, it's an RPG, you jump into a world with other players and you go and fight monsters and bosses down on the little maps and levels. That really captured my imagination. The great thing was it worked flawlessly worked flawlessly there was very very little lag if at all on my 56k connection so if you can imagine that some of the lag we've seen in some of the recent games uh try playing on a 56k modem it actually worked very very well so that was one innovation that uh, i really enjoyed the other innovation actually has to do with the controller <clears throat> and i've got the controller right here now as you can see it has an analog stick up there and a D-pad down here. This is actually the pattern that a lot of um, controllers use right now. It's got these buttons here, very similar to how they are on the Xbox and PS4. We've also got triggers on the back. These introduce triggers for FPS and driving games, uh, which you'll see on every controller now. So just the controller design alone, I believe, uh, is one of the best and really one of the first modern style controllers you can see the depth of it and I really enjoyed that now the expansion slots up here were really interesting two expansion slots I have a rumble pack in one so you can rumble and I have a memory card this is a big memory card in here but this came out with a memory card that actually had a screen on it I can't find mine unfortunately but it was called a visual memory unit a VMU as we call them and you would pop that in here and there would be a little LCD screen all right we're not talking we're not talking a modern cell phone screen it was just a black and white liquid crystal display but it showed options from the game so if you were playing a football game on here you could look at your plays right here um, you could look at additional information this is basically the birth of second screen play before anyone ever had a smartphone or a tablet so if you've got smart glass or a game app that you run on your phone uh, you can kind of owe that concept to the sega dreamcast controller with that games also added some cool features to this the vmu as well like sonic adventure you could raise these little guys called uh ko's or chows and they're basically little tamagotchi guys um you could put them on here and take them with you and kind of care for them and feed for them away from the console. It was just a really cool second screen experience. And then when you uh, did certain things with those characters, you could bring them back into the game to get extra levels or abilities and things like that. So I think the controller plus some of the built-in features of the system were really in innovative. Didn't have DVD drive built in, which was unfortunately another thing that 
caused people to not want to buy it since DVD players were very, very expensive at that time and PS2 had one built in. Now this was a lot cheaper when it came out than PS2, but it just it just didn't sell as well. Now, I mentioned Choo Choo Rocket. <clears throat> Here it is. Uh, very quirky looking. You can see uh, some crazy cat and mouse games. Online multiplayer game. I made a big deal about that. On the back, some more information. This was actually made by Sonic Team. So uh, it was a pretty high quality, fun game. I'm surprised they don't bring this back onto some of the newer consoles or even a tablet. I think this would make a great tablet game. You can see the disc there. And Space Channel 5, which I don't have, but is a great game. The other one that I want to show you is the web browser. So this console actually had a web browser. Uh, and you could think at that time, uh, not a lot of people could access the web from anywhere but their PCs. Okay, this was the time before smartphones, before smart TVs, before the internet was just everywhere and easily accessible. Uh, you could connect this to your dial-up provider or through AT&T WorldNet service, you could get it, uh, and load this disk. You put this disk in, it'll pop up a browser, and you could use the web, send and receive email, and chat with people across the globe with your Sega Dreamcast web browser. Very, very cool. My mind was blown first time I did this. I thought it was so cool I could use the internet on my TV. So looking back on that, uh, we've come a long, long way. All right, so I'll get into some of my top games. This is by no means a comprehensive list. There are a lot of great games for Dreamcast. So if you can get your hands on one at a used game shop or an eBay, um, you will have tons of fun with this thing. I don't have all the games that maybe I would have wanted back then, but uh, I'll show you kind of my, my top favorite games that I did have back in the day and then I played. So without any kind of uh, ranking, these are not ordered. I'll get into the first game that I ever played on it. And this is kind of the launch game that sold this console through. This was the first true Sonic 3D adventure done the right way. And it's a shame they don't do the current games in this style. This was just uh, an amazing experience. You had some cinematic um, triggers in certain points of the level. It would come out to a different perspective and, and kind of show Sonic running towards the camera and stuff blowing up behind him. Uh, the sensation of speed was just awesome. You would go through the loop-de-loos and upsides of buildings. Um, and it was just super fast and fluid and really fun to play, really easy to play. Um, this was a launch game, and, and I just loved it. This is probably the best Sonic game of all time. Sonic Adventure 2 was good, but, um, you know, it was kind of a rehash of this and added some other characters that you had to play as, which weren't as fun. Some of the levels on here are a little bit boring too, but uh, just having Sonic, Knuckles, and Tails uh, alone in full 3D at that time was great. And the music was really cool too, actually. The next game that is kind of a cult classic is Shenmue. This is a game out of Japan. It's an RPG with a huge open world. At this time, the open world um, was incredible. It was basically... An entire city, okay, so this, I think it takes place in Japan in the 1980s. Um, the whole city, there were mini games, games within a game. You could go into an arcade and play arcade games. You go to a vending machine and get stuff from a vending machine. You could talk to NPCs. Any NPC you saw, you could talk to and interact with. Uh, it had real-time weather, real-time uh, daylight and nighttime. Um, the graphics were incredible. The gameplay was okay. It was mainly uh, fighting, melee uh, kind of combat with a lot of quick time events. So you'd go to a scenario, you have to press the buttons in the right order, which could be kind of frustrating. But really, it was all about the story and the environment and just appreciating the beauty of the game. This was actually a fairly long game. It came on two discs, and um, they never got to finish it. This was going to be part one of part three. Part two actually came out on Xbox because uh, by the time they came out, Dreamcast was discontinued. I did play that. It, for me, it wasn't as special as this version. Um, and Shenmue 3, we're still waiting on that. So, Sega, can you just please release Shenmue 3 for Xbox One or PS4? That would be awesome. Um, but I definitely recommend you check this out if you pick up a Dreamcast. The other one, uh, an another game uh, that I already sort of previously mentioned was... Uh, Fantasy Star Online. So Fantasy Star 
was a series uh, on the you know Super NES, Sega Genesis, things like that. It was an RPG and it was 2D. This brought it into the 3D world. It made it an online RPG. So this is really one of the first MMOs that we saw on consoles. At that time, there were EverQuest, there was Ultima Online on PC, but if you were a console gamer, uh, we hadn't had that experience yet. So uh, this game really uh, brought it to the forefront for us. It had a lot of uh, fantasy elements, but sci-fi elements at the same time, which was really cool to see. A uh, really cool story, combat system, um, and a lot of the things you see on games today, especially Destiny. Destiny almost seems to me like a spiritual successor of this game, just the way that it's laid out, and even down to the little robot that follows you around, the little um, the guy from Game of Thrones that follows you around in Destiny. Uh, in this game, there was a very, very similar... Uh, little robot that followed you around and helped you do things. So um, this game is definitely one of my favorites of all time. The artwork was really great. The classes, you could have lightsabers in the game. I mean, what's not to like back then? And 56k dial-up. That's all we needed. All right, so NFL 2K. I believe this was another launch title. And this kind of helped get us over the fact that EA did not produce Madden. And once this came out, we didn't need Madden. And this was before EA got the exclusive license to the NFL. Uh, so there was actually competing NFL games out there, if you can believe that. Um, this game had incredible graphics, incredible 3D, but the environmental effects were really what got me. I saw a demo of this before I bought the system, and they showed a match, I believe it was at Giant Stadium, and it was snowing. So you could see the snow come down, you could see it Put a dusting over the field you could see the players footprints making impressions and you could see the breath because it was so cold you could see the breath coming out of their their visors that blew me away um the collisions the tackles the player models at there was just nothing like it at this time and um this was the nfl game for me for a couple years i think i got nfl 2k1 as well um because this was kind of before you could update rosters, but you could even see how old it is with who's on the front. <laughs> That's how old it is. All right, another innovative game, great game, another Japanese game, Jet Set Radio. This had a sequel on Xbox as well, similar to Shenmue's Jet Set Future, Jet Set Radio Future, which I played. Xbox was kind of a spiritual successor to Sega, if you think about it. Especially because this thing ran Windows CE. That was the operating system in Dreamcast. So I believe that's how Microsoft kind of got their feet wet in the, in the console game. But that's another topic for another video. This game was cell shaded It was one of the first games, I believe, ever to be cell shaded um, The graphics just looked incredible. The style. The style was just this vibrant, graffiti, anime style. You could... Um, you were on rollerblades and you would just dash through the city, you could grind on anything and basically spray paint and graffiti and tag different things and run away from cops and beat up other gangs. Um, really, really, really interesting. And you could see that's what the disc looked like. This is with the back. This is another game I wish that they would resurrect uh, and put on a modern gen system. I think it could be really, really compelling because um, so many games are the same these days. I mean, we've got so many uh, FPSs, so many sports games, RPGs. That's really all that's on the market these days. Um, what we're missing is these just funky games that go on a limb that have their own sense of style, their own gameplay that's just addictive and, and fun to play. It's kind of like Sunset Overdrive, if you think about it. Um, it kind of looks like that and plays like that, except this is not about zombies. It's about tagging stuff. All right. Now, did I mention the system was innovative? This game proves it right here. This is a game that I probably nobody would ever make or allow on their system these days. It's just too weird and too experimental to put money into. But this was done by Vivarium on Sega Dreamcast. It's called Seaman. And there was a lot of comments made about that name. But it's basically about a little fish that you grow in a tank. And that's all the game is. It's a tank. It's a fish tank. And you grow it from this little egg, basically, to this fish or this creature with a human face. It was very, very strange. A little disturbing. There were other creatures in the tank, like little squids and stuff. 
Uh, but basically, you had to care and feed for this and grow him and evolve him. And that was the whole point of the game. But what was really, really innovative was that you could talk to this creature. There's a creature back there um, with a microphone. It came with a microphone attachment that you put into the controller. And this was one of the, one of the first games that had speech recognition and artificial intelligence. So, you know, you might be talking to your Kinect. This is, again, the great, great granddaddy of that. It had a microphone. You could talk to the fish, and it could respond back to you and do different facial expressions. So if you were mean to the fish, you would sort of be sad. Uh, if you said something nice to the fish, he would be happy. So very, very interesting game. Takes a lot of patience, not your run-of-the-mill game, but really the fact that I could talk to it intrigued me and, and made me pick it up. There was a sequel to this, by the way, so I guess it did sell enough to, to warrant that. All right, so this is a game you probably know. There's It was on a bunch of other systems. I think it came to GameCube, Xbox. Been a few sequels. It's Crazy Taxi. This is the original. Uh, this is another just great game with a sense of style. I, I think I want to plug this thing back in and play it, actually. These, this is getting me excited. Um, you would basically play as a taxi driver, and you could pick, uh, I think it was three taxi drivers, and you would basically drive around a city that looked super cool. I mean, it was super realistic at the time, um, and pick up... Um, pick up different fares and bring them to the destination and try to rack up as much money as possible. There were different game modes. You know, you could compete against the clock, uh, compete for money and things like that. Um, the collisions, the, the passengers and the um, drivers all had their own personalities and attitudes. And the soundtrack was great. I mean, you had Offspring and Bad Religion doing the soundtrack. It was only a couple songs, so you got pretty sick of them after a while, but they definitely kind of fit the vibe, California kind of punk vibe with this. So another just great, innovative game that no one had ever seen before. Crazy Taxi. Okay, and finally, to round out my top games, we can't not talk about Soul Calibur. Soul Calibur, this is the original here, was just an incredible fighting game. Uh, Mortal Kombat at this time was... Kind of dead on the vibe. Mortal Kombat 4 had come out, um, and it would be a couple years before it kind of got resurrected with Deadly Alliance and, and those games. So we really were looking for a fighting game. Soul Calibur came out. The player models, the character models were just incredible. Um, they looked super realistic. They flowed nicely. The combat was just very, very nice to play. You could pick up two controllers and just jump into a game with somebody and start playing. It was also compatible with the arcade stick which had come out so um, you could really you know uh, play it like as if you were an arcade and uh, I wasn't really really big into fighting games but uh, this one I played tons of and I think I got the sequel so <clears throat> that's Soul Calibur um, interesting story as well to it uh, it's one of the fighting games with a story that is not just complete BS so there you have it there's the Throwback Thursday retrospective at the Sega Dreamcast. May it rest in peace. I had lots and lots of great quality fun times with this. And I hope you did too. If you didn't, maybe go pick one up on, pick one up on the internet. Go try it out. Uh, tell me, do you have memories of Dreamcast? What was your favorite thing about the system? Did you not buy the Dreamcast? Do you regret it? Uh, I want to hear from you. And, you know, shoot us some other ideas about what you want to see from you know future throwback thursdays what can we take a look at and kind of take a trip down memory lane of uh some of those good and bad uh tech gadgets or games from back in the day all right so that about wraps it up hope you like this video hope you subscribe to the channel we're pumping out a lot of content want to make sure you don't miss a thing make sure you follow us on twitter at geek kings and hopefully we'll see you next time thanks for watching